You can turn in your Bibles to Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is to many the most difficult chapter in the book of Matthew. It's sometimes called the, the little book of Revelation. <laughs> and that's because a lot of the language used in Matthew 24 will remind you of some of the language used in the book of Revelation. And it's not the language we usually find in the Bible. So what I'm going to do is try to carry us through this chapter, and I think what I'll, I'll be able to do is show you the general structure of the, chapel, uh, the chapter so we can put all the, the verses in context. And then once we do, we'll know how to go about thinking about the, the verses that we come across. I'll show you how this works. But first, we've got some memory work. Two memory verses. And this one is key. Matthew 24 and verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. You know what the word verily means? Well, sometimes it's translated truly. When it's used at the end of a sentence, it's translated amen. Isn't that interesting? So it's like saying amen, I say unto you. Only we usually use that at the end. And at the beginning, amen means so be it. And so this is how it's going to be when he says that. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. The second memory verse, Matthew 24, 44. Therefore be ye also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Okay? All right, now let's get into the end of the text. I want you to remember how Matthew 23 ended with the lament over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jesus said. Your house is left unto you desolate. He's talking there about the temple. And then he says, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now, when you're talking about the coming of the Lord in the Bible, sometimes you're talking about the Lord coming when, when he came to earth in the flesh and dwelt among men. Sometimes you're talking about his second coming. He's going to come at the end of the, the world and then the judgment that follows that. But sometimes it's talking about his coming in judgment. And that's what he's talking about here as I'll I'll show you. Now, not, not in judgment at the end of the world, but in judgment upon one of the cities here on the earth, you see. Now, Matthew 24 then begins. Jesus went out and departed from the temple. See, that's the house left desolate. Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. They were very proud of their temple and all its buildings. Why? Herod had been working on this over 40 years, and it'd be another 30 years before it was finished. And they're very proud of the physical structure of that temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone on another that shall not be thrown down. And that's quite a startling statement. Well, as he said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, now this is key to the chapter. Watch this. They said, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Two things here. When and what sign? That's what they're asking. And the way they ask that question, it seems as though they are thinking, you know, when this temple is destroyed, that must be the end of the world. They're thinking that temple is going to be there till the end of the world. So they've got those two events, the destruction of the temple and the end of the world all, all together here. But they're asking, when will it happen, and what will be the sign? 
And in the reply, Jesus is going to answer both of those questions, both for the destruction of Jerusalem and for the end of the world. So how do you go through this chapter and figure out what he's talking about? Is this talking about Jerusalem or the end of the world? And he uses language sometimes that looked like it could go both ways. So how do you go into Matthew 24 and figure this out? Well, here's the key. It's in the memory verse. Matthew 24, 34, he says, Verily I say unto you, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So what he says down to verse 34 are things that will be fulfilled in that generation. That's when he's talking about Jerusalem. Now you could draw a big line in your Bible right after that passage. And you might even want to, if you mark in your Bible, to draw a line right across just above verse 35 because now notice in verse 35, he says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. And here's what we're going to find when we get into the text. When it comes to the destruction of Jerusalem, Jesus is going to tell them when that will occur and what signs to look for. And when it comes to the end of heaven and earth, Jesus is going to tell them, no one knows when that will happen, and there'll be no signs. And with that, I think we can go through there and see, and the way he talks about those two events so differently helps break those two things apart. Now, if you got that general structure of the chapter, I think we can go into it now. Look at, look at the answer Jesus gave. First, let's talk about the destruction of the temple between now and then, okay? Here's what's going to happen. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Now when we hear the name Christ, I know what we think. We think of a spiritual Savior, don't we? But you got to remember now, the Jews expected an earthly Christ. Someone like one of the judges in the book of Judges to rise up, and raise up an Israeli army and throw Rome off and let Israel rule the world. That's what they thought about Christ's coming. And so some are going to say, I can do that. I can do that. Look, don't be deceived when you hear that. You're going to hear about wars and rumors of wars, but, but the end is not yet. The end what? This is the end of Jerusalem, the end of that temple. Not yet. Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. See, the earth is going to go into turmoil among the, the nations of the world, and you think it's bad in there. Listen, that's just the beginning. It's going to get worse. And so he goes on. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many because iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. It says there that they're going to hate each other. They'll betray each other and hate each other. Let me tell you what happens, and history tells us this, and Josephus records the event. When Rome came up with their armies and surrounded Jerusalem, before they made their attack on Jerusalem, the Jews inside the city turned one on the other. There were three 
factions that went to war against each other inside the city. And they hated each other. They killed about as many of each other as the Romans killed of those that remained. This happened just exactly the way Jesus said it was going to happen. Now, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. You see, there's about 30 years from the time that, 30 or 40 years, 30, 40 years from the time that Jesus ascended into heaven, and he sent his apostles out to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And Jerusalem was going to remain until that gospel got away from the Jews and was spread out and was being received by the Gentiles and you turn that gospel loose where it goes into all the world and then the time for Jerusalem will come for its demise and its destruction. Now, there's going to be a sign and this is what you do when you see the sign, okay? Okay? When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. What are we talking about? Well, I'm not going to go into Daniel. Now, Daniel's a very difficult book as well. I know the story about Daniel in the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and that's not too hard, but you get further into Daniel and you think you're back in Revelation. I mean, the, the apocalyptic visions. But Daniel talked about the abomination of desolation, and it was a desecration of that which was holy, and it would be heathens in the temple of God. And when you see that happen, then flee to the mountains. Let me tell you what happened. Josephus tells us. When Rome came up against Jerusalem, the first place they attacked was that part of Jerusalem where the temple was. And those Roman Gentiles were inside the holy place of the temple. Now there's your sign. When you hear that those Romans have penetrated the temple and they're in the temple, you need to get out of town. You flee to the mountains. This can't be the end of the world. Unless if it's the end of the world, it doesn't do any good to head to the mountains. See, if, if you think the world's coming to the end and you think it's going to help you to run up Ben Lomond Mountain, that, that's not going to help at all. You're, it's still going to end. So this is not the end of the world, but this is the end of Jerusalem, okay? So you head to the hills, you flee to the mountains, and let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him that's on the housetop not come down to take anything out of the house. Look, if you've got, if, he's telling it. Now, if, if you got your cell phone in your house, just leave it there, just run, just get, get you know, whatever it is. A lot of time we think, what would you take if your house was on fire and you'd run in and get something? And that's the kind of thing you talk about. No, don't even go get it. You don't have time. This is too urgent. When you see the sign, you need to get out of there. He goes on and says, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Those old dirty clothes you've been working with in the field, just be glad you got them and leave. Don't go back and try to get your good clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and them that give suck in those days. It's just harder to flee like that and to survive like that. You've got to take care of little bitty infants and little bitty children. Pray that your flight be not in winter nor on the Sabbath day. Well, in the Sabbath day, see, the, the gates of the city would be shut so you couldn't get out. And then in winter, think about how hard it would be to survive in the hills in the winter. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world of this time, no, nor ever shall be. Well, how could Jesus say something like that? Well, it was a terrible destruction that was going to happen. But you got to remember, when Jesus speaks of these things, he sometimes uses exaggerated language. And you're going to see that we saw that in Revelation over and over, didn't we? And so he's using this to emphasize the fact that this is really going to be bad.
Now, except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Let me tell you what Josephus said. He said when the Roman armies came and entered Jerusalem, then they backed off and they stopped and they waited. The Jews that did not believe thought, oh, see there, the city's not going to be taken. But the Christians knew what that meant. We got to get out of here. And the Christians escaped the city while the Jews remained in the city to be destroyed. Just like Jesus said it would happen. And then it says, then if any man say unto you, lo, he is here, or Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders inasmuch as if it were possible. They shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I've told you before. Wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in secret chambers, believe it not. And then this language. For as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now this is his coming in judgment. And everyone's going to be able to see this. And it's going to happen fast. And this is the Lord's coming in judgment against Jerusalem. Remember that. There's other things. He says, for wherever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. You've seen that. You've seen a deer on the road and the carcass and the old buzzard birds come up and gather around it. So Jerusalem is the carcass. And all the Roman armies are the eagles. And they're going to come and just pick that little place to pieces. And then this. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. And people see that and they think stars are going to fall out of the sky. Or the, the moon is just somebody's going to turn the moon off or something. Well, this language is used commonly in the prophets and on into Revelation. Remember, God set the sun to rule the day and the moon and the stars to rule the night. And so this is the language the prophets have used to talk about the, the downfall of the rulers. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Some people think, well, you're going to go up there and be a sign in the sky and say, Jesus is in heaven. Look there, you can see it on the sign. Well, here's the sign. The sign that they're going to see is the destruction of Jerusalem. What's that a sign of? It's a sign of the fact that the Son of Man is in heaven and he is running this thing. He is doing this and it's all going to happen just like he said. And when you see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, I want you to think about how it feels. When you see those old thunderstorms come rolling in, that's an ominous thing, isn't it? And so Jesus in his judgment on Jerusalem is going to come and it's going to be an ominous thing. And you're going to see his power and his glory as that city is laid into rubble. Now this, he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, one end of heaven to the other. What's that talking about? Well, angels are messengers. He sends his disciples into all the world to preach the gospel. And he gathers the saved into his church. That's what he does. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So what did he do? <coughs> this is the sign, and this is the time, this generation. All right, let's go to the next part of the chapter. Here we pass the great divide of Matthew 24. He says, there's going to be no sign, and there's going to be no time for the end of the heaven and earth. Watch this. 
Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now he told them, Jerusalem, what time that would be, that generation. But of this, no one knows when the end of the heaven and earth is going to be. He says, but as in the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For in that day that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not till the flood came and took them all the way. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was warning them and they knew he's building an ark, but they didn't pay any attention. They went on about their life. They were eating. They were drinking. They was making wedding plans and they was getting married, expected to have families and homes and didn't pay any attention until it was too late. And the Lord has told us he is coming again. And look out in this world. How many people paying attention to that? People going on living like he'll never come. And when they finally figure out he is coming, it's going to be too late. Now, then shall be two, then shall two be in the field. One shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. One shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. See, they don't know the time. And so you're out there working with your buddy and the Lord comes. You know, it says in, uh, uh, that we're going to be called up to meet the Lord in the air. There's going to be a separation some of us are going to be with the Lord when he comes and some are not. And that's the separation he's talking about here. But know this. If the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. And then here's the verse. Not, not quite. It said, Therefore be ye also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. See, there's not going to be any sign there's not going to be any warning. This is your warning. There's not going to be another warning. And so you need to watch and you need to be ready. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord made ruler over all his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find him doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delay his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with a drunkard, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint his portion with the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You leave someone in charge of your household and you go away. And then you come back and what do you find? Well, the yard is mowed and the, 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 the dishes are clean and the house is neat and the kids are taken care of and the cattle have been fed and he's out there just working and busy, just taking care of everything and you reward that servant. Well, what if you do and you show up and everything is in a mess and the servant's over there drunk? Well, you're going to punish that servant. And so what is he telling us? We need to be busy about the Lord's business, don't we? We better be ready. We need to watch for him, and we need to be ready, and we need to be busy. For you know not the hour when the Lord doth come. In the language he uses, right at the end of this chapter, is the language used to describe eternal punishment. He's going to cut him up. Says he'll cut him asunder. Appoint his portion with the hypocrites. Well, what did he say about the hypocrites? Woe unto you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Remember that? That's where you're going to go. And then he says, they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, as we get into chapter 25, which we'll do in a couple of weeks, we'll get chapter, he's going to elaborate and continue to build and describe this punishment and all the way to the end of chapter uh, 25, and we'll see just what this punishment is, but he starts talking about it now. Okay, that's chapter 24. 
You know, I think you got a better handle of that, don't you? If you've pondered over that, it is difficult if you just go verse by verse without thinking in general of how it all fits together. Because some of those verses sound like, well, now, wait, that, that sounds like that could be the end of the world. But you need to understand them in their context and how the chapter flows. And they can all be explained. And these things will happen coming up to the destruction of Jerusalem. And then the rest of these things are going to happen coming up to the end of the world. Okay, here's a lesson for us. <laughs> Here it is. Are you ready? You don't want your portion with the hypocrites, okay? Now, you know, some people say there's hypocrites at church. I'm not going to church. There's hypocrites at church. Well, you know what? First thing, they're probably being too hard on folks. There are people that come to church that are struggling in their lives, and some of them struggling with sin, and they're ashamed of it, and they're trying to do better, and that's not a hypocrite. We help people like that. But there are people that, there's some people that just like to pretend they're religious and they're not, and that's different. But you know what? There's hypocrites at the grocery store. I have seen people at the grocery store that weren't there to buy groceries. They're there for something else. Those hypocrites. I've seen hypocrites at ball games. They go to a ball game and they don't even pay attention to the game. They're not interested in the game. They got something else on their mind. They just sit there and yak and talk and the game goes on. They don't even know who's ahead or who's winning or what the score is. This, if you're trying to get away from hypocrites, the best place to go is to go to church. And then go to heaven. But if you're not ready when the Lord comes, you get to spend eternity with hypocrites. And you don't want that. So, I'm going to send the invitation. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And if you'll do that, You'll be ready when the Lord comes. So if you want to respond to the invitation, do it while we stand and sing.